Hello, everybody. Welcome to another recording for History Bite Podcast. Today, I'm joined by Dr. Joseph A.P. Wilson. How are you doing today, Dr. Wilson? I'm d- doing very good. Thank you for having me, Jacob. I look of course. Of course. You know, Joseph A.P. Wilson is an online uh, adjunct professor of religion in the College of Arts and Sciences at Sacred Heart University. Dr. Wilson is an anthropologist as well as a religious scholar, and his works primarily focus on native peoples of North America and East Central Asia. Other research interests include Buddhism and religion and ecology. He is also a book reviews editor at the Journal for the Study of Religion, Nature, and Culture, and a volunteer uh, uh, curatorial assistant in ethnology at the Springfield Science Museum in Massachusetts. So I want to begin by asking you, what is your view on the synoptic problem? Thank you for having me. Okay, so as a preface to your viewers, I am not a specialist in the synoptic problem. As Jacob's uh, introduction suggests, I have published some stuff related to um, early Christianity. And as somebody who teaches history of religions on a regular basis and ancient history on a regular basis, it's something that I think about a lot as a teacher but it's not something that where my primary research is. So let's just get that out of the way. Um, But my view of the synoptic problem kind of follows conventional wisdom for the most part with a few caveats. Um, I do think that Q exists, existed most likely. I don't know for sure. And I think Goodacre and um, Goodacre has done a good job of of defending the Farrow hypothesis in recent years, and that with the Farrow hypothesis keeps Mark as the first. So Mark and priority is now fairly universally agreed upon by most scholars. Um, but the the question is: is did the subsequent synoptic authors, Matthew and Luke, did they rely only upon each other and Mark? Or were there was there an additional lost source that was um, that we call Q? Q is just a placeholder name for an un, unknown document. Um, and for a very long time, Mark and Priority has been associated with the the presumed existence of a Q document, which is primarily a sayings text, which is the key, which is the second source in addition to Mark that the later two synoptics would have relied upon. But Q does not exist in any kind of a um, manuscript form as a discrete manuscript. So it is indeed a lost document if it exists. Um, So my view is that Q likely exists for a number of reasons, even though it can't be proven to exist. And that its existence, uh, that as a thought experiment, if you see Q as a real document, that it answers a lot of important questions about very early Christianity. And that it, and the fact that it is non-Pauline, not Pauline, and it lacks, um, the content of Q lacks overt Christian dogma, right? It doesn't include the name Messiah, you know, it doesn't identify Jesus as the Messiah, for example. It puts it more squarely into a Jewish Christian context. And therefore, um, it provides a good sort of second early source in addition to Paul. Pre-Markin source. When do you think this text could have been written? Well, again, and then so before we started recording, Jacob and I were talking a little bit and he favors um, later dating for the epistles. Um, Whereas I tend to follow conventional wisdom and think that the epistles are pre 70 the 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 genuine epistles of paul are, are pre 70 um and i think that also q is pre 70 i think q is older than mark i think mark is probably you know around 70 give or take a couple of years i think that um mark has no indication of being i mean sorry not mark q had the reconstructed shape of Q has no indication of being written after Mark. So I think that, and this is why it's a problem for minimalist Jesus mythicists, that why the, why the um, opposition to Q is kind of a tenet of that form of 
Jesus mythicism because it would stand side by side with Paul as an independent and, and, but being very distinct from Paul, not Pauline in its content, but right. standing next to Paul as a kind of a contemporary early um, textual source for the Jesus movement. Yeah, because why would somebody put the sayings of Jesus together in a document about a man that never existed? Well, yeah, that's right. And and what what Q looked like. So when when was Q written exactly? It's hard to say, but I can say that I don't think it originates. It, I don't think it's a late document. Obviously, if you have these other documents, uh, Matthew and Luke using it, then it must have existed in prior to them beginning their projects um whether it whether it was composed at once or whether it was like a uh, accumulated over time it would have re resembled its final form around the same time that mark was in circulation um one of the one of the problems that people don't often remember is that mark is poorly attested in terms of manuscript evidence too uh, early Mark editions of Mark are very, very fragmentary and not, you know, like it's, I forget the exact numbers, but of the four canonical gospels, John is, John and Luke, J John is like by far the most attested, which is the latest, right? Which actually kind of makes sense if, if the, if the later documents survive better, but they were also most more popular in some ways because they represent a more kind of developed view of the tradition right like they they reflect the the values and and ideas of christians at the time they, they were written and later so therefore um the popularity of john is part of its is related to the fact that it's relatively late and 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 is more on the pulse of second second century christianity right so you say so you have the later documents in the canon that survive better uh and whereas the earlier sources, all of them, are the ones, um, well, I shouldn't say all of them, the, the, the Pauline epistles, the, the authentic ones were pretty popular too and also widely circulated. But the early gospel, Mark, the earliest gospel we have, only has a handful of really early manuscripts, despite the fact that it is undeniably a precursor text, one that is essentially prior to Matthew and Luke and that they depended they both independently depended upon to compose their own gospel narratives right so you see where I'm coming from the at but yeah it has a un, a less developed Christology mark is less and and it's not, it's less overtly Christian I mean it is Christian but you know what I'm saying it's it's got it's more embryonic in terms of its dogmatic, content it's got a lower christology it's more adoptionist in terms of its view of, of jesus etc um so these factors led to it being less popular less copied and this means that one of the major objections probably the biggest objection to q the most the one that has the strongest support uh the strongest empirical basis are the so-called minor agreements of matthew and Luke in the triple tradition, so the part where they depend on Mark, but where their their revision of Mark agrees with each other against Mark, right? So where people would say they have to be literal, that the the, the 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 gradient of literary dependence in the so-called minor agreements is between either Matthew and Luke or Luke and Matthew, where they they both make the same modification of mark does that make sense so that's one of the biggest objections to q yeah. there can't how can you have all these minor agreements and there's quite a few of them they're really subtle how can you have all these minor agreements um if they aren't reading each other and so therefore we say luke and luke and or matthew must have known the other uh the other secondary synoptic source Right, the the other one of those two books. Well, when you realize though that our reference, our references to early Mark are so poor, this throws that in a different light. What do I mean by that? 
the version of Mark that we have, canonical Mark, may not be very similar to proto Mark. Early Mark is likely somewhat different than the Mark we possess because um, of the patchy transmission in the first century. So, so where I'm coming from is which edition of Mark did the other two evangelists have? We don't know. And if the version of Mark that they both used was even slightly different than the version of Mark that survives, then this can explain the, explain the minor agreements all by itself. And we see this a lot with poorly preserved documents where we see three different three or, you know, two or three different manuscripts and they're all wildly different from each other and they're all early. So like the gospel, according to Thomas, the Greek, which is pr probably original from the Oxyrhynchus dumps, um, the papyrus trash heaps in, in Egypt, the, the Greek fragments of Thomas we have do not conform closely to the language of the more complete and later um, Coptic edition, which is a translation from the Syriac, right? And those differences are significant enough that, you know, that they, that they are on the same level as the so-called minor agreements against Mark. Does that make sense? Do you see what, what the analogy I'm making here? Yeah, I get it. So you suspect that proto-Mark could be not just, could it be that not just somewhat different? Could Is there a chance it could be even more different. Yeah, there's always a chance, but there's no reason to assume it's significantly different, but simply that these minor differences in terms of like phrasing, because you know, when scribes, when scribes loosely paraphrase the work that they're transcribing or whatever, or when there's a translational step involved or a dialect difference or something like that, right? And where someone is clarified, you know, there, there, there's all, if something is widely circulated and there's lots of copies around, then it's harder for those subtle editorial changes to stick. But if you're dealing with only a very small number of manuscripts and there's not a lot of no ways to compare notes between scribes, right? Then one individual idiosyncratic decision to reword this passage, maybe not even change the meaning too much, but just like, you know what I mean? Like just change the grammar a little bit or make it, yeah. you, you know, like, like play with the rhetoric somehow, then all of a sudden the gist is the same, but it looks different in the, in the jot and tittle. And it's no longer, it's no longer closely adhering to the exact form of the earlier text. And so when you have relatively few manuscripts and when, you know, when it's like a bottleneck effect, right? In genetics, where you have a small founder group, the smaller, the, the smaller, the, the pool of early manuscripts, the more likely new independent variants will become dominant in later transmission of the text, right? So during, so you can say that Mark definitely went through a late first century bottleneck, early second century or something like that at some point after the composition of Matthew and Luke, which became much more popular and much more stable in their transmission, that early Mark would have been, would have gone through a bottleneck where people were neglecting it. It wasn't considered as good as interesting, right? They just didn't, they didn't reject it, but they didn't see it as, as important as these other more um, developed gospels with the more like, you know, uh, with all that front matter, all the nativity stuff, which was all seen as being, you know, really important to the tradition. So the fact that Matthew is getting copied more than Mark means that Mark's, possible deviation from the autograph is the potential deviation from the autograph in Mark is much greater. And so we can't make assumptions about the, the original state of the manuscript. And we see obviously somewhere between the almost verbatim transcription of Mark that makes it into both Luke and Matthew and Mark itself, these changes were introduced and who did it? It, it's not necessary to say Matthew must have read or Luke must have read Matthew in order to account for these these subtle uh, minor agreements. Are there manuscripts of Mark's gospel that do deviate other than just 
other than one having a longer ending of mark and the other having a short ending of mark? Well, again, the problem is without a lot of manuscripts, we can't say, I mean, I'm not, I'm not sure how many complete man, early manuscripts there are. There aren't a ton and they don't, I don't, and I think they're pretty close to the, for the most part to the ones that come later. The major issue is, as you say, the long ending versus the short ending. That's like the, that's like the, the major change. And people have debated, debated about whether the, the, most people think the short ending was original. But it's also possible, and I, I forget which scholar proposed this. Again, I, I'm sorry, I don't. My notes are on my other computer, which is currently in the shop. But um, my, um, I forget which scholar proposed this. But somebody has suggested that the original ending of Mark may be lost for this very reason, right? That because of poor manuscript transmission, that the short ending is like a an abbreviated ending that was tacked on because the original ending is completely gone. And it may have been accidentally. It's also possible that the original ending had, um, how shall we say, less than orthodox implications, right? If the original ending of Mark was one that didn't, that talked about a spiritual resurrection in very explicit terms, right? As opposed to a bodily resurrection, that kind of a, an ending for Mark would have been problematic and there would have been a reason why, if those those pages fell off your manuscript, you wouldn't bother to to replace them with any kind of um, uh, fidelity, like any kind of. So I'm sorry, my my computer's making noise because somebody in our in our uh, yeah, it did for me as well. Yep. All right, Jacob and I are part of a, sim a circle of people on on social media, and that's where I, that that was coming from. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so. So the um yeah uh if you can't kind of get what I'm saying that 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 this is an interesting idea and this is what got me thinking about this one of the things that got me thinking about this is that um that we don't really know what the original what early mark looked like we 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 can say it with less confidence in some cases than some of the the documents that have more um robust preservation I'm going to see if I can turn off that notification noise let's see Uh, it might, it's still doing it. Okay. I'm going to see if I can turn off. If you right click it, yeah. a, there should be an option to mute there. it. There. Okay. I just turned off, turned off notifications. All right. Sorry about that. You can edit that out in post production. Yeah, that's fine. Um, so do you get where I'm coming from there about um, the minor agreements not being a major obstacle? For Q, there are uh, there are they are an obstacle for Q, and they are a legitimate uh, piece of evidence against Q, but they're one that can be easily explained by a number of case the ways. Um, Bedoun, in his book about Marcion re reconstructing Marcion's New Testament, makes a point that minor agreements may not all be present in Marcion's version of. Luke. So another possibility is that through scribal actions, as you know, m subsequent generations of scribes were copying Luke and Matthew side by side, that there is uh, a tendency to harmonize them, right? That Orthodox scribes might end up like, in other words, if you're copying one of the three synoptic gospels and the original source text is Mark, but it's a near verbatim parallel in Matthew, then a scribe copying Luke might just take the form in Matthew. Um, this isn't to say that this explains the bulk of the minor agreements. I don't think, I think most of them are still present in the earliest manuscripts, but at least some of the minor agreements might be um, a result of Orthodox harmonization of the um, scribal harmonization of the other two synoptic gospels. Okay, another another point that the Goodacre people, the Goodacre advocates make, that's a, that's a fairly strong point, is that there's a kind of a broad structural parallel between M Matthew and Luke. You know what I'm talking about here? Like just the sort of the way the narrative unfolds with where the, where the nativity and the genealogy are located in the overall document, right? And that this 
speaks to a likely shared knowledge of you know one of the other are you familiar with that that view yes i also think that that is not a deal breaker for q i don't i think that it is a it is certainly um put in the column against q but it lacks the kind of verbatim agreement that you see in the double tradition material the the the, the 2dh material q proper right it lacks any kind of that sort of really really precise linguistic similarity and it's more general and thematic and then again here's where marcion comes in for me if marcion's gospel of the lord is in fact closer to a prototype for luke before the name luke was attached to it and i am sympathetic with marcion scholars here it's um quite possible that the structural parallels to matthew's matthew's work were again introduced by the orthodox redactor of the lucan narrative so the first two chapters of of luke are absent in marcion's version as reconstructed by Badoon. But virtually all the Q material is still there, right? Uh, or, or I should say all the um, the sayings portion of the of the Q material. So the, the the Q material that's absent in Marcion's edition of what we call Luke, but which he did not call Luke, um, that edition includes pretty much the entire sayings portion of Q. If Q weren't real, why would it have such integrity in, you know, this, this variant version, right? So in other words, it, it suggests that the integration of the two sources in the two document hypothesis would have happened before Marcion and that um, possibly after Marcion, maybe those first two chapters of Luke were then added. I tend to be sympathetic to the notion that the author of Acts, which was unknown to Marcion, may have been an orthodox redactor of the gospel narrative that's in the center of Luke, and that that same redactor wrote the first two chapters on the official final edition, if that makes sense. And that would explain, again, how Matthew's structure could influence that process, and that what we see in these sort of, like, very symmetrical forms of the two sort of uh, the two authors we call Matthew and and Luke right that their 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 work has a lot of structural parallel and that could have become come from the fact that Matthew became the model not for the original core in the Lucan narrative but for the final form of the Lucan narrative so it's a longer redactional process so you would date canonical Luke after Marcion's gospel. So that that would push Marcion's gospel, I, I, I guess, in between Matthew and Luke? Potentially. I don't necessarily think that Marcion's gospel is exclusive to Marcion. So when we say Marcion's gospel, I might say proto-Luke. I think that Marcion is somebody who is receiving his gospel from a community that's been around a while. He wasn't, he didn't invent his religion. He was somebody who was a second generation member of the Jesus movement. And I think his father was also a high ranking clergy, if I am not mistaken. So um, again, I'm not, I'm, I don't have all my, you know, resources in front of me right now. But if Marcion is actually continuing a tradition that's been around for a few generations, then what, what I'm taught when we say Marcion's gospel, all the gospels in the very early period weren't, didn't have names attached to them. And they might not have been, and there might not have been communities that have, that had multiple gospels together in one community. It's possible that like, in other words, different groups of Christians use different versions of the gospel narrative. And that, so the one that we call Luke now, an early form of it lacks some of the sort of framing, the framework of the the one that we, the canonical Luke. And I'm not 100% sure when it would have been written because a lot of the work on the dating of Luke uh, 
has to do with material and acts, right? Like, like when people who date it before or after Josephus, right? What are they doing? There may be some stuff from the gospel narrative itself, but the, when you, if you ignore acts and if you ignore the, the, the first couple of chapters, then Luke is, or what we call Luke, what the, the Evangelion, or, you know, or Marcion's gospel, whatever, proto-Luke, it would lack less secure, it would be less easy to date, right? Because you wouldn't have the, the red flags that Acts provides for certain dating hypotheses. What do you think about the theory that there's a lost version of the gospel of Mark that contains the minor agreements? Yeah. And that's sort of, I mean, I think that's what I was getting at a minute ago is that I, I'm not necessarily saying it's proven, but I'm saying that that is not, it's a very re realistic hypothesis to say that um, Mark doesn't look like canonical, that, or, that Ur Mark, original Mark doesn't look very much like canonical Mark in terms of the, the sort of very subtle wording of particular passages because that i mean ancient scribes were more concerned with meaning than they were with the literal word for word uh replication of stuff and they would often see a very accurate paraphrase that was concise and uh effective at communicating the meaning they might even see that as as superior to a a um a clunkier original right and it wouldn't see, be seen as betraying the spirit of the author to make those kind of revisions so we can't i'm just i i'm not necessarily saying that we have evidence for this but i'm saying we certainly can't rule it out and it's entirely plausible if assuming that this is true that matthew and luke used a different version of mark when do you think canonical Mark was written then? Again, I think I, I I think that Mark is fairly close to the destruction of the temple. And I'm not saying I know for sure what the Jesus movement was thinking about this stuff prior to 70. I think that um, there's a good case to be made that the writing was on the wall, right? That That things were... Things were moving in that direction before 70, right? There were that somebody, a local person around the temple would have realized that things weren't safe and that it was so. So the idea that somebody in the decades before the temple's destruction actually prophesied the destruction of the temple, that's possible. But when would such a prophecy, whether or not it was made, when would such a prophecy become relevant? When would it be highlighted in the literary tradition? near when it happened. So I think regardless of regardless of whether you believe um as Christians do that Jesus really predicted it or not that I think the impulse to write about it as a successful prophecy would have occurred after the prophecy was fulfilled or when it looked like it was about to be fulfilled. So I think that um the, the the you can't get too much earlier than 68 for mark to push it bef before 68 would be kind of a little bit odd whereas which is different than q like there's no in in the q material there's no obvious post 70 red flags for me it's sort of like the the seven epistles of the seven authentic epistles of paul all those documents q plus those seven None of them have obvious signs that they were written in the aftermath of the destruction of the temple. I mean, with one or two tiny exceptions, which are debatable. I want to go back to uh, what we were discussing earlier about mythicists and their view on Q. Yeah. It seems like to me they want to get rid of it because it's like I was saying earlier, uh, that why would they collect sayings of Jesus of somebody that did not exist? And how could it also add right. that why would Paul meet the brother of someone that never existed either? Yeah, yeah. So we could go into all of the, the all of the debates around um mythicism. Uh 
But I think to, to just focus on Q, I think that Q is a thorn for mythicists, not just because it's allegedly early. And I tend to favor an early date for Q, a pre-70 date, possibly the same time that Paul is writing his letters. So 40s, 50s. Um, yeah, I think I think 50s makes sense for when a hypothetical Q would have been written. Um, so it's not just that it's another early source alongside Paul, which is something that minimalist mythicists don't like. But it's also that the content of Q is so completely Jewish. It's a very, it's 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 got more resonating in some ways with some of the Qumran material. With you know, it's not it lacks overtly Christian dogma. It never says Jesus is the Messiah, right? The word Christos does not appear anywhere in the Q material. So the fact that this verbatim overlap in the two source material. This is this is suggests again that there is an actual source behind the agreement between Matthew and Luke. If if Q were just Matthew's original composition that Luke happened to find useful and plucked out of Matthew and recontextualized in his own sort of haphazard way, which is what the Q skeptics would argue, then why would he so clearly avoid Christian dogma? in that material. Luke is clearly a Christian or, you know, I mean, Luke, it's, it's in Luke, it's in, it's in Acts, which is attributed to Luke. And like I said, maybe the Orthodox redactor, it's in Acts that the word Christian is first used and applied to the community. So clearly the, the notion of a, um, of Christian dogma is not bothersome to these two authors. Why would either of them compose a bunch of material that was so non, not obviously Christian in origin. And so it suggests to me that the Q material is closer to the Jewish, the, you know, the Jewish roots of the tradition in some ways than Paul is. Um, James Tabor has made this argument and I kind of agree with him. He's made the argument that in terms of the ethical teachings in Q, they're much more aligned with the epistle of James which is Jewish Christian, right? It wasn't, was not part of the early, the early Gentile Christian canon at all. Yeah. And so that would also give you a reason why Q would be neglected as a separate document, right? It could be used by these authors mined for material to produce these official gospels, but when as, as a standalone document by itself, it was it didn't mean that much to the a, a, an overtly Christian worldview because it didn't have like heavily Christian influenced dogma. If you are familiar with this, what do you think of the late Burton Max uh, theory that Q developed in stages? Um, yeah, I, I, I'm somewhat familiar with his work and I'm familiar with that argument. And that's sort of related. I think, did, Den, did Dennis R. McDonald make a similar um, similar case? John Dominic Crossan, did he make a similar case? I think that there, the, the, this kind of the notion that Q is not an instantaneous, uh, doesn't spring out fully formed as one document that's stable for all time. I think that's pretty strong. And I think the genre... The, the genre comparisons to other ancient sayings texts or what they're called um, uh, epitomes, right? Where basically famous people, like you said, you wouldn't do this to, you don't do this for fictional people, right? This, this person that's a real person gets their, their work mined for quote, for pithy quotes that are assembled into a, a body of like the wit and wisdom of Abraham Lincoln, right? That would be an example of this, right? You, you go through, you read Lincoln's speeches and you make a book of just the, the, the pithy quotes that you then use to, to um, do what you will, you know, use for rhetorical purposes. So the fact that we see this genre outside of ancient Christianity, this genre of the sayings text, right? And we see it inside ancient Christianity in the gospel according to Thomas, which is not directly dependent on Q, but overlap, but still Thomas and Q overlap like about 30%, right? There's, so there's, 
a chunk of Thomas that is connected to Q. But um, but Thomas is a later source, right? But it's in the same genre. So the fact that the genre existed in early Christianity and that with Thomas, for example, we see it evolve over time. We know, I know, I, I think that you can safely say that there are at least three very different versions of Thomas in the world that, that existed in the past, right? With the early version being less distinctively Gnostic. I mean, Thomas, Thomas as a whole isn't really very Gnostic. It's not like class, even though it's found with other sources that are considered Gnostic, it's one of the least Gnostic of the Gnostic Gospels. But in its Syriac, or I should say in its Coptic version, which is a translation of a lost Syriac version, um, it has some affinities with Gnostic theology that have been, and, and but when you look at the Greek fragments from Oxyrhynchus of Thomas, those Greek fragments are less Gnostic than, than the um, later one. What would be the best example of this? Uh, uh, saying number five in the Gospel of Thomas, which is about, you know, all that is hidden shall be revealed, right? Well, in the Greek version, it goes, all that is buried shall be resurrected, or all that is dead shall be resurrected, something along those lines. So there's a, there's a line tacked on to the end of the earliest version of Thomas in Greek, which is um, pretty close to the Jewish notion of the bodily resurrection of the dead, which is to say that it's more like normative Jewish eschatology and less like the more Gnostic eschatology that would say bodily resurrection is not important. So that gets dropped, right? That that sentiment gets dropped from our more complete um, Coptic edition of Thomas. And then you can see later, still, the Manichaeans, which we don't have the Manichaean edition of Thomas surviving as a, as a separate doc document, but we have clues about Manichaean exegesis of Thomas. And we know that Manichaean editions would have been Manichaeanized a lot, right? Like they would have had a lot of uh, injection of, of, you know, the prophet Mani, who's famous syncretic founder of a new world religion in Persia in the third century, right? That becomes really big on the soap road, but uses a lot of Christian ideas and a lot of Christian documents in its, at its foundational stage. So the fact that Thomas would have been used by the Manichaeans in their own way and then developed in their own way, right? So like a sayings text isn't a static thing. A sayings text can absolutely grow and change. And the fact that we see these different examples of this genre in ancient literature and we see the one surviving in Christianity is very different than Q and much later than Q suggests that, yeah, um, collections of sayings were living things that could have been added to and subtracted from over time. And that when we talk about Q, we're talking about a really early example of this genre that is lost. Um, was Q added to in stages? Probably. And there's a reason to think that maybe the narrative frame of Q, the stuff about John the Baptist, which isn't found in Marcion's version, but all the saying stuff is, right? So maybe Matthew and and canonical Luke, maybe they were using an expanded form of Q or, or a kind of a form of Q that had had a, a narrative framework added already. Maybe there was a codex at some point. Maybe there was a series of codexes that are now lost that included an early form of Mark alongside a sayings text and maybe some stuff about John the Baptist added too, right? Like you could think of a very, very early co collection of documents that were important to the Christian movement or to the Jesus movement in the first century. That um, that didn't necessarily have, you know, that would have been independent from Paul's epistles. So the, the Pauline material is probably circulating more in the diaspora. While around Judea, maybe these, these or I shouldn't say Judea, Mark is clearly not written in Judea, but you know what I mean. I'm saying that among certain groups of Christians might have been more interested in the narrative stuff and in the sayings, right? As opposed to what this Paul guy is doing. So the fact that we don't have that, so it might not be just one missing source. There could be several missing sources that are closely um, associated in early collections of manuscripts that are influential moving forward. So, so Q could be expanding and contracting 
at that phase. But but that is hypothetical. That is, I mean, that's pure speculation. That's not, I'm not say making an evidence-based argument there. Do you think that the Gospel of Thomas could have contained sayings of Jesus that go back to Jesus as well? Um, yeah, I'm not a hundred percent sure about any particular saying uh, ascribed to Jesus, but there are indeed some of the sayings in in the Gospel of Thomas that are among those that are widely considered to be likely original. So like, um, you know, um, the Jesus seminar book, I think, um, uh, the five gospels, you read that? No, I haven't gone to that one yet. It's a, it's, it's a good, um, example of, you know, the state of, uh, historical Jesus studies several decades ago, but it's still, it's a classic work and very, very worth reading. But I think one of the strongest statements that they claimed based on multiple attestation, the, the variety of different sources that that attributed this to, to Jesus is the line about a prophet is not honored in his homeland because it's found in the synoptic tradition. It's found in John. It's also found in Thomas, right? And while some people would argue that Thomas depends on the synoptic tradition, it, few people would argue that it, Thomas depends on John, right? I think it's John 4, 44, right? Something like that. So it's like there's this, this notion that a, G, that a prophet is not respected in his hometown, which is which the Jesus Seminar said is probably, you know, one of the statements that we can be really, really certain came from Jesus himself. Because basically he was like, you know, had a heart, had, wasn't um, in his own village in Galilee. He was not treated with the respect he deserved. And so that seems like a historical fact, possibly, right? Which caused him to move his mission outside of his, his birthplace. And it's like, um, yeah, the fact that that's there in Thomas is 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 interesting. In terms of other other statements, I don't know for sure whether they go back to Jesus or not, but there's a lot of sayings in Thomas, and this is why I disagree with Goodacre. Goodacre, uh, like many Q skeptics, they don't want Thomas to be the the analog or the the genre model for Q, and so they say, oh well, it's a kind of an epitome, a late a late derived. So like we're making a wit and wisdoms of Jesus book and we're going to go take the synoptic gospels and we're going to pluck sayings from them and build the gospel of thomas so so there's an argument that the gospel of thomas is is actually a late synthetic derivation of the synoptic traditions but that doesn't quite do it for me the overlap with the synoptic materials is there for sure but the precise forms of those those sayings don't line up close enough in my opinion and i can't and i'm sorry i don't have um a bunch of good examples right in front of me but in quite a few cases thomas provides a sort of more developed context for particular sayings that just sort of appear willy-nilly in the synoptic tradition and that context is occasionally suggestive of a more of an earlier source right so i'm not saying that that Thomas had the earliest source or that it was written before the synoptics, but that it may rely upon traditions that are prior to both, at least in part. All right, so the one other thing that I wanted to mention real quick is um, an article that I haven't heard many people discuss that is um, from the year 2011 in the journal Two New Testament Studies, written by David L. Mealand, M-E-A-L-A-N-D, and I can provide the link for you uh, later. And sure. that's the article is called, Is There Stylometric Evidence for Q? Now, stylometric tests basically use quantitative um, analysis, uh, empirical analysis of grammatical nuance and linguistic nuance in a document to assign authorship. And so it compared the Q material to the M material. Now, if your readers are familiar with the work of Bart Ehrman, uh, 
some people believe that Matthew had an additional lost source they call M, which provides uh, some of Matthew's material. Um, regardless of whether that's an, a separate source or not, we can think of M as the part that is not Q, not Mark, and found only in Matthew. So it's fine to think of it as original to Matthew. So, so we can say the so-called M material in Matthew is the stuff that we have no other author other than Matthew to ascribe that M material to, right? So essentially you can think of that as Matthew's original writing. Hmm. If the Goodacre hypothesis is correct, then Q and M are the same author and there should be no meaningful stylometric difference between Q and M. Q and M should not segregate into different authorship categories under stylometric analysis. This article by Meland suggests that they do in fact segregate into diff different authorship categories. So that means that there was a caught, and there, it's not a slam dunk case because it's like 80% of the time they could, the, the computer could correctly identify the grammatical context in, in mm -hmm. either the Q or the M category. So that means that according to the abstract, the results are a cautious preference for the two source theory, AKA Q against Ferrer and Goodacre. Um, so I just, I thought I wanted to, to raise that. It's just one other small piece of information that would be re relevant. Hello viewers. Thanks for watching this video from the History Valley YouTube channel. Please don't forget to subscribe and hit the notification bell. And if any of you wish to further support this channel, please consider checking out this channel's Patreon page and becoming a patron and or donate through PayPal or through Super Chat during a live stream. Thank you.